Why? Relentless, probing, fearless. This is Emmy Award winning Full Disclosure with Leslie Dutton, bringing you the truth by revealing the news behind the news. Hello, I'm Leslie Dutton. Today on Full Disclosure, we're bringing you the news behind the news in this part two of our program investigating the conflict between the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority and the Union Rescue Mission. We interviewed Michael Arnold, who is the executive director of LASA, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. He explained what LASA does for the homeless. We do three things. We administer uh, funding from the city and the county, as well as from HUD. We serve as the lead agency for the Los Angeles Homeless Continuum of Care, and that means we coordinate the annual filing of the McKinney-Vento um, HUD homeless funding uh, application that goes into HUD every year. Uh, and, and then we also do compliance management for the city and the county on all of the HUD funding and homeless dollars that get invested in programs throughout the city and the county of Los Angeles through the city and the county. We ask him to explain how he distributes the funds administered through LASA. Through LASA, we have about $75 million a year that we administer for programs, again, around housing, around employment, uh, around um, helping people manage issues that may have caused their homelessness. Um, but a significant portion of our homeless population remains unsheltered and unable to access services. Is this the result of the current recession, we ask him? There has been a large homeless population on the streets of L.A. for as long as memory serves. What's happening now is that that gap is getting bigger. So we are seeing reductions in federal dollars both through HUD programs, including the, develop, the Community Development Block Grant Program, uh, as, as well as other resources, mental health services, uh, physical health services, uh, that reduce even further the ability for people who are homeless men, women, and children um, to access services and housing that we need to have to get them back off the streets and into um, stable permanent living conditions. Reverend Andy Bales is the executive director of the Union Rescue Mission. His organization has just pulled out of the winter shelter program but is continuing to provide services to the homeless at the Union Rescue Mission. We ask him to define the difference. The biggest difference is, is the the winter shelters were just basic. You let people in at night at 5.30, feed them, get them out of the rain, uh, let them take a shower and put clean clothes on and sleep in a bunk until early, early in the morning, pack up a lunch and send them packing and they're out for the day. But that's all we could do. We didn't own the winter shelters, we didn't own the armories. So it's just basic, life-saving, support and a bit of encouragement and it's good it's I mean it's better than nothing whereas at Union Rescue Mission you know you're home for the day you can rest in your bunk anytime you attend classes there's an expectation of sobriety uh, you get spiritual counseling you get one-on-one -on -one counseling you attend AA meetings or or NA meetings Christ-based uh, celebrate recovery um, you're, you're loved at both places, but you really have love poured on you at, at Union Rescue Mission and high expectations. That's, that separates it quite a bit. One has no expectations, come in any condition, and Union Rescue Mission has high expectations. We expect the best out of you. And so that's the biggest differences. So the winter shelters had to take anyone and everyone. A tottering drunk was allowed to sleep right next to a mother and her children and any advocacy of the Christian faith was strictly prohibited. Right, and you couldn't differentiate with sobriety unless it was, you know, criminal and you had to call the police to, to intervene. Um, you, you don't pray, um, you don't share your faith in those winter shelters. We did have church groups though, wonderful church groups show up, serve a meal, and come and hug people and bring socks and shoes. And so we still, I guess you'd say we snuck some of our Christian values into the, the winter shelters, which made them better. Um, but, uh, but we went by the letter of the law as far as prayer and everything else. But according to Reverend Bales, one of the strongest messages to all of us from Jesus was to tend to the poor. 
He suggested that for people who have been completely destroyed personally, professionally, financially, and even spiritually, this Christian love gives them a breath of optimism to carry on. Oh, absolutely. It's, you know, it, well, if it's what, uh, if it's what uh, provides us with hope for the future and it causes us to do the good that we're doing, why wouldn't we want to share what our life's purpose is about and, and where our love comes from, why we care and uh, cherish people, and why we describe people experiencing homelessness as precious people experiencing homelessness. So, so um, it's natural for us to share why we do what we do, and, and many people at a moment in their life where they've lost everything and have no hope uh, hope's the best ingredient uh, for, for solving their future problems. It's the best uh, antidote, I guess you'd say, uh, for life. Not just a new place to live or a new job, but real hope uh, in the future, which we believe our faith gives us. But the Los Angeles Housing Services Authority doesn't deal in hope. They objectively distribute tax monies. As money becomes available, we're, we, we do public procurement. So the city or the county may say we have this money that we want to invest in these kinds of services or this kind of housing. Uh, we will be the pro procuring agent, so we'll issue a request for proposal. We'll widely distribute that request for proposals, and then nonprofits will submit proposals to try to acquire that funding and then deliver the programs. You know, it was interesting. I think probably within hours after that meeting, I noticed an RFP request request for proposals that went out from Lhasa to people in District 1 of the county to help people who are uh, currently on welfare, uh, who are in, in need of emergency shelter, and not one person responded, not one agency responded to that request for proposals. So as my, my greatest fear is that next December 1st, when it's raining and under 40 degrees, that no other agency is going to step up and do those winter shelters and I'll be going home thinking about all the people that are out left in the cold and the rain knowing that if things would have worked out we could have been providing at least a cot for 800 uh, precious people. We're going to take a quick break right now and when we come back we'll hear from Reverend Bales about how his fight to rescue the poor has been going on for decades. We'll be right back. In the government, there's a phrase used to restrict access to information. That phrase, need to know. At fulldisclosure.net, we want you to have all the information you need to be an informed citizen, unlimited access to all the information we've gathered on our TV show. And if you can't watch us on your local cable station, streaming video of complete shows when you want them. Fulldisclosure.net, when you need to know the news behind the news. Welcome back to Full Disclosure and our expose of the conflict between the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority and the Union Rescue Mission. Reverend Bales is determined not to give in and give up in the face of Los Angeles politicians. We are going to do what we can do. We're going to open up 200 cots downtown, unfunded by the county, and we're just going to ask our donors to step up during that time, December 1st, whenever it's rainy, raining or below 40 degrees, we're going to open up those cots and invite people to come in and we're going to do it on our own and we're going to do what we can do because we're not going to be able to carry out the, the winter shelters anymore. But I hope somebody will, somebody with deeper pockets will step up and provide those services. They're much needed. We need even more than that. We, we need more than winter shelters. We need year-round regional services. And I understand from our meeting at the county that's what they were driving at. But they said that it all started with us. If we'd shut our front door, then those other regional services would spring up. And we were saying, no, when you spring up those other regional services, we will not have to have families at Union Rescue Mission. So we have to see you do it first before we shut our doors and leave kids out in their cars and in the alleys and out on the streets. How does a reverend become an activist? Apparently, Reverend Bales made this conversion long ago. Yeah, it actually goes all the way back to Des Moines when gangs first started showing up in Des Moines, Iowa and started uh, doing their initiations by beating up homeless guys on the street. And I cried out and said, 
police, you better do something about these gangs. Oh, there's no gangs in Des Moines. And then I got a videotape of a gang beating a homeless man as he wandered down the street, and the police acknowledged that there was a gang problem, and my homeless friends were made much safer by a strong police presence. He found a similar problem here in Los Angeles. And then when I came to uh, Union Rescue Mission, I was waiting on the kids to return home from school, and I watched a cab do a U-turn and dropped a woman with dementia and, uh, in, a, in a hospital gown off in the middle of the street in Skid Row, and I watched her walk down the street of Skid Row to go around a corner of, you know, that's just a horrible, violent corner. And I called the police and said, I think I've witnessed a hospital dumping. And I called a staff member to go rescue the woman. It ended up that uh, this woman, Carol Reyes, had dementia, high fever, high blood pressure. She'd been dropped off from a hospital 20 miles away and brought and dropped off. There'd been rumors of hospital drop-offs of patients, but, but this was the first ever, and we had it on videotape. Like the Rodney King incident, that video became viral. So that videotape played around the world and uh, was on 60 Minutes and Dateline and, and uh, 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 Anderson Cooper 360 and played around the world. And actually the hospital came the next day and apologized. And so far, hospitals have been fined millions and millions of dollars in L.A. And now there's a law against hospital patient drop-offs. Uh, drop and there's a law against mental patient drop-offs from another case where we found, working with the city attorney, that 155 mental patients from as far as 40 miles away had been dropped off onto the meanest streets of Skid Row over a 22-month period. He explained the history of L.A. Skid Row. It's the worst human disaster in the country, and it's in L.A., and it was from a policy of let's drop everybody who's troubled off from the suburbs and from the surrounding cities and let's drop them off in this 50 block area and turn our back on them and they created this worst human disaster in in the u.s motivated by his christian faith lyman stewart came to help the denizens of skid row and what we've been trying to do and what many people have been trying to do since then is stop the flow in of people so that we can help people get out and get each region to take care of their own neighbors, their own brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles who are experiencing homelessness and no longer bring them and drop them off in Skid Row. So it's hard to go against the tide, but we've been trying to go against the tide and, and uh, really change the heart of Los Angeles, help us to live up to being the city of angels. The current tide is being forced by the Los Angeles Housing Services Authority. And you don't live up to being the city of angels by closing your front door to precious people, especially children, who are experiencing homelessness. So we think we're going to lead by leading, not by shutting the door. Now that Skid Row has become infamous, we ask him if disadvantaged people are coming from across the nation to get a handout at the Union Rescue Mission. There are some, but, the, but that's really kind of a myth that people come to California to be homeless in this nice weather because there's more than the weather that will kill you. The vast majority of people on Skid Row are actually from L.A. and from South L.A. in particular where there's lots of injustice and lack of jobs and family breakdown and a poor school system. So the vast majority of people who are on the streets of Skid Row are actually South L.A. residents who've given up a lot of hope and that's, that's the tragedy. Certainly we have people like me who've come from Iowa you know, to live a better life and things didn't work out and they ended up on the streets of L.A., but, but not many. We don't find many people who traveled from Iowa here to, to uh, live on the nice streets uh, during the wonderful weather uh, because, as I said, there's more than the weather that will kill you on these tough streets. Full Disclosure was alarmed by the blog written by Reverend Bales where he expressed his righteous anger at being told to close his doors by government officials. We wondered why other media wasn't interested in his story. It's interesting because I sent it to some uh, journalists who just didn't respond and maybe they don't believe that conversation happened or maybe the powers that be don't want them to speak up about it, but you're the only 
uh, journalist who followed up and followed through with me uh, after I reported. Is this another example of the bias against people of the Christian faith? The media has often been hostile, portraying evangelicals as fanatics, holding on to their guns and their religion. We're going to take a quick break right now, and when we come back, we'll explore the issue of whether providing for the homeless enables them to continue in their hopelessness or empowers them to grow into becoming productive members of society. We'll be right back. For the news behind the news, wherever and whenever you want it, go to fulldisclosure.net and get programs on topics affecting you, weekly updates and alerts on hot topics, video streaming of Full Disclosure episodes. It's award-winning, hard-hitting, corruption-fighting news coverage. And it's only available at fulldisclosure.net. Fulldisclosure.net, the news behind the news. Welcome back to Full Disclosure. We question Michael Arnold, the executive director of LASA, the Los Angeles Housing Services Authority, if giving food and shelter to the chronically homeless merely makes it easier for them to remain homeless. That is something that everyone was guilty of in the past. Uh, one of the things that we've learned over the course of the past four years is, is that our goal is not to serve people, our goal is to house people. So what we have specifically done is focused all of our contracts on how many people have gotten housed and not how many people have been served because ending homelessness is about getting people into housing. It's not about providing them a cot and two meals a day. Reverend Bales claims that the Union Rescue Mission has taken a new direction because of this issue. We addressed uh, the question of whether we're enablers uh, just recently because I would say yes in our history. In the past, we were enablers and we had a guest program uh, that simply was three hots and a cot and we preached the gospel to those willing to, to hear it and we didn't make a big impact on their behavior and we didn't have an expectation of sobriety. But now they do. LASA doesn't require the people they contact to be drug free or maintain sobriety. They just want to get these people under a roof somewhere. And that will supposedly take care of the problem. Again, part of what we have learned through really looking at data is that oftentimes substance abuse is a symptom of something else. And dealing with all of the issues uh, helps people to then seek um, relief from their substance abuse. If we exclude people who are substance abusers from programs, we will never get them stably housed. When we take people off the streets, we get them into housing and we address the issues that they're dealing with, many if not all of them then deal with their substance abuse problems over time. So it really becomes a, if we don't provide those services, don't get them in an environment where we can better manage their mental illness, their physical disabilities, um, we will never end homelessness. So we've got to get them housed and we've got to give them the opportunity to deal with the other issues and, and they often, if not always, then begin to address their substance abuse issues. Reverend Bales explained how the Union Rescue Mission has changed their program away from three hots and a flop to life transformation to actually motivate people out of their homeless, helpless condition. Six years ago when I came, I said I have a different way of doing that and I'd like to try it and I was turned down because they'd never done it that way so and then as times got tougher I introduced it again about 18 months ago I said I'd like to charge our guests a small fee and it'd be seven dollars a day I d did this at the mission in Des Moines and five dollars of that fee would go to case management intense case management to help them get on their feet two dollars would be personal savings and they'd save up enough money and there'd be an expectation of sobriety if they stay here and they can rest in their bunk any time rather than having to sleep at night go sit in the waiting room during the day come back at night I want to make it like home to them but I also want them to attend some classes classes he has a very active class schedule in place at Hope Gardens as we saw in part one, Hope Gardens has classrooms for every age level, including a fully equipped computer room. 
I want to get away from the three hots and a cot and move to what I call the I call it a gateway program, where they're taking responsibility for themselves, paying a little bit, because when you pay for yourself, you feel a little bit better about yourself, and you affirm your dignity, and you learn to save, and and when you have high expectations, I think people have high success rates. People will either rise to the occasion or not, depending upon their motivation. Giving people hope and fostering high expectation appears to be an excellent motivator. So in other words, here, here's my argument. If you have a place with a thousand beds that people can crash in any condition, there'll be a thousand people crashing in any condition. If you have a thousand beds where people have high expectations and when you expect a lot of them to succeed, there'll be a thousand people succeeding. So we made that transition as of April 1st of this year and we transitioned our 300 guest beds into 300 gateway beds and the transformation has been remarkable. People who were there merely for an easy handout found they had to earn it. People who weren't motivated to improve had to leave. The place calmed down, the attitudes changed. One guy told me that it went from a den of hostility and anger to a place of peace. He said everybody that didn't want to change and wanted to cause trouble left and everybody who's come in and wants to change stayed and it's been a, and I got a lot of heat for that I mean I've I'm a mean guy for having high expectations and an expectation of sobriety but I can honestly say we we are not enabling anybody we're empowering people to change their lives but we are not enabling people to stay in their current condition and that's why we're one of the reasons why we're making such a focus on life transformation Mr. Arnold thinks it's important to change the popular perception of the homeless in Los Angeles. I think that our homeless populations tend to be invisible. Uh, and, and what we do see of our homeless populations tend to be a reasonably small component of those who are homeless, and that's our chronically homeless. We think of homeless as, as the probably mentally ill person who has been on the street corner or at a bus stop and panhandles and has done that for years and years and years. The reality is, is that we have many, many more folks who are homeless in Los Angeles that, don't, that aren't chronically homeless, that need a temporary helping hand to get back into housing. And I think understanding the full complement who are homeless in our communities is really valuable. It's really valuable information. And I think it points out um, how much more we could do with appropriate resources to get people, men, women, children, families, uh, back on a trajectory that gets them back into housing very quickly. According to Reverend Bales, the LA Homeless Services Authority claims to make a priority of getting children off the mean streets of LA's Skid Row. He just thinks that closing the door to them is a poor way of doing it. I will, I guess, on behalf of the county say that when they met with us, they say their concern is they don't want precious children on Skid Row. Well, we don't want precious children on Skid Row either. We, we do everything we can to make Union Rescue Mission inside of Skid Row as safe as it can be for the children. So we don't want them on Skid Row either. And so they would say, well, we don't want kids on Skid Row. That's why we don't want them at the Union Rescue Mission. Well, we say we agree with you. So help us with Hope Gardens so we can move all the families out to our Hope Gardens Family Center away from Skid Row or create other regional services so we can move all the moms and kids out of Union Rescue Mission away from Skid Row out to those other regional services. And so we can hear both Reverend Bales and Mr. Arnold advocating regional homeless facilities to disperse the concentration of those currently living in downtown LA. The big question is how to do it. People don't want homeless shelters in their neighborhoods. We asked Reverend Bales what he thought the public wants to do. Well, I hope that people would go for the place that says keep your doors open and keep welcoming precious kids who are experiencing homelessness. Don't even let one child experience the devastation of homelessness on the street. So I would hope that they begin to support Union Rescue Mission uh, stronger so that we don't have to rely on anybody to, to keep our doors open. And I would hope that they'd get behind Hope Gardens Family Center so we can keep moving moms and kids away from Skid Row uh, out to a beautiful, safe place far from sex offenders and all the trouble that's 
all around us, the violence on, on uh, Skid Row. Even Mr. Arnold was optimistic that the bureaucracy was moving in a positive direction. They now have a plan. And so there's a lot of very, very good things that are happening that I think are kind of counterbalancing the fact that we have a terrible, a terrible e economy. Um, the federal government has a federal plan to end homelessness. Uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, with the help of the United Way and the LA Chamber's um, uh, business task force, we now have a coherent plan to work on ending veteran and chronic homelessness in Los Angeles. We have the city and the county rallying around um, these plans. So it's really a very exciting time in terms of being able to see progress uh, in ways that we've not been able to in the past. So I would say it's really still very challenging, but there are lots of good things going on that we want to continue the momentum on so that we can really reduce and end homelessness here in Los Angeles. Reverend Bales echoes the sentiments that government cannot provide the ultimate solution to homelessness. I think people will recognize that if the government funding is shaky and if it's not certain, and if it's being moved into other priorities, like one priority right now is housing first. So uh, move all the money to build houses and move people in to those houses without any expectations of their behavior. In other words, take somebody off the street with an alcohol or drug problem, stick them in a housing unit with a roof over their heads with no expectations on their behavior. How will that work? Or fund Union Rescue Mission where we teach life transformation and have high expectations and teach sobriety and teach responsibility. I hope they'll see where the bang for the buck would be and that is in investing in life transformation rather than what I call survival and subsidy. We want to thank Mr. Arnold and Reverend Bales for appearing on Full Disclosure. We want to know what you the viewers think. Do you think that government housing programs can provide life transformation and salvation for lost souls? Please call our Full Disclosure Town Hall number and tell us what you think at 1-800-867-7777. That's 1-800-867-7777. And if you leave your name and number, we'll get back to you. Or you can log on to our website at fulldisclosure.net and leave your opinion there. And if you leave your email address, we'll be happy to respond. I'm Leslie Dutton. Please join us next time for another edition of Full Disclosure. Thank you. To respond to this question or comment on this program, please call 800-867-7777 or visit fulldisclosure.net. Transcripts or DVD copies of this program are also available on our website. Full Disclosure, the news behind the news. I think that's the bigger picture with Proposition R. Whether it's three terms in office or two terms in office, whether you have to work so many hours as a lobbyist before you have to register, yes, those are important issues. But they're, they, they are superseded by the corruption of the very fabric of the integrity of the system that we have. Were LA voters snookered on Proposition R? Did they know that by voting to supposedly limit council members to three terms that they were actually extending the terms which were already limited to two terms? Full Disclosure is here to show you how you can be an easy victim of ballot fraud next on Full Disclosure.
Relentless, probing, fearless. This is Emmy Award winning Full Disclosure with Leslie Dutton, bringing you the truth by revealing the news behind the news. Hello, I'm Leslie Dutton. Today on Full Disclosure, we're going to bring you the news behind the news in this interview with David Hernandez, a longtime civic leader 